Hello again and welcome to Spotlight, the interview show on RT. I'm Al Grunov and today my guest on the program is the Grand Mufti of Syria. While the Syrian rebels and the government forces keep shooting at each other, many parties try to find a way to settle the crisis down. There are different opinions about Bashar Assad and the current regime. Some say he must step down, others argue he's the only one who can restore order in the country. Here's the religious point of view. My guest on the show today is Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun, Grand Mufti of Syria. Syria's Grand Mufti Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun says his mission is to stop the bloodshed in the country. The Mufti says Western interference in the civil war only increases the violence. He believes peace is possible. Steps toward it should be mutual. Dr. Hassoun stayed firm in his beliefs even when his 22-year-old son was shot dead in the street. He publicly forgave the murderers for the sake of a peaceful future for Syria. As a respected Islamic leader, Dr. Hassoun rejects the concept of a holy war. He says the violence could not be justified by any religion. In one of his speeches, Dr. Hassoun said, No war is holy, only peace. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for coming to the studio. Well, first of all, I want to start with the latest news, with the footage we're uh, receiving from your part of the world every day and every hour. Most of the world televisions, uh, television stations carry those, those pictures that we're getting. Mm. Well, this is the reaction. I know that many of those people haven't even seen the footage. They haven't even seen the film, the American film that, that, that this reaction to. Have you seen uh, the footage? Have you seen the film? What can you say about it? Is it worth it what's going on? Thank you very much for having me here on RT. I'm very glad to be here in Moscow and to take part in Spotlight. About the inflammatory material offending the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this is not the first time. In fact, this is the third time that such offensive material targeting our Prophet has been released in Europe. In reality, such productions, be it film, video footage or other, do not offend our Prophet Muhammad or Jesus Christ, nor do they offend the Prophet Ibrahim. They rather degrade the producers and the authors of such materials. What the West is doing now is aimed at fueling chaos, instability and violence in the Arab and Islamic world, because the media focus on such materials and seek to circulate them among the people in order to provoke them. If we look back at the Danish caricatures mocking the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I have heard about them six months prior to the beginning of the unrest in the Arab and Islamic world. We spoke to the caricaturist and invited him to visit Syria so that we could show him the real image of Jesus Christ and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's not the caricatures that were the problem, but the moral standards and the attitudes they reflected. Six months later, the media, especially Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, started inciting people over these images. What's happening now in the Arab and Islamic world is rather fueled by media coverage than by the film itself. This is because most protesters know nothing about the film and haven't even seen any of it. If you remember, long ago, a very famous Arab movie director named Mustafa al released a film about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the same, this movie maker was subsequently banned from most Arab countries. This is all the result of provocative media coverage aimed at stoking chaos and disorder. And this time, the media have succeeded in agitating people into attacking embassies and killing diplomats. The aim behind all of this is to destabilize the Arab and Islamic world and to force people to fight among themselves as well as set themselves for a confrontation with the West. I think there are Western institutions and organizations behind these provocations. Their aim is to spark popular outrage and focus on the unrest without ever mentioning the prime reasons behind this outrage. You know, in, uh, in Christianity, when somebody is trying to insult God, 
or Jesus Christ, yes? We say that Jesus Christ, he's uninsultable. It's impossible to insult him. Well, well, because he is God. Is it the same with Prophet Muhammad? I mean, is it possible to insult him? To, to, can he lose his face? I think this is impossible. So, does he need this protection? Like I said in the beginning, the Prophet Muhammad cannot be insulted by a caricature or a film. This is also true of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The Arab and Islamic communities have been agitated by mass media, not by the film itself, because most people haven't seen the film. Arabic and Western and American media incite people and provoke them to act against something they haven't even seen. The end goal is to destabilize the Arab world and submerge it into a state of permanent chaos and disorder. This shows that there is a political game behind all of this, aimed at serving certain interests of the West as part of their colonialist intentions. But the West is still losing its hegemony and its dominance, and we no longer live in a unipolar world controlled by the formidable American power. It is once again an increasingly bipolar world, as we see Russia gradually regain its position in the world as a global power, second only to the United States. The West aims to instigate chaos and disorder across the Arab and Islamic world and then spread it further onto Russia. We know very well that Russia is surrounded by Islamic countries and these countries will revolt tomorrow because of media scandals. Here we would like to tell them once again that our Prophet cannot be insulted by a film and the Muslim's response to such an offense should not be attacking embassies, burning buildings and killing people, but rather looking for dialogue. We should invite the authors and the producers of this film to a discussion, but like I said, there are colonialist militias and political institutions and organizations at work who are interested in inciting chaos and disorder in the Arab and Islamic world in order to distort the image of Muslims by making them look like rampant killers. I have uh, read one of your quotations when you said, I quote, what is happening in Syria now was masterminded 10 years ago. So, uh, when people say that what's going in the Middle East today, it's not really the reaction, but it's rather uh, just, it shows that the Arab world is generally anti-American. Is that what you mean? Exactly. What's happening in Syria right now was started in Iraq 10 years ago. When they occupied Iraq, the US Secretary of State visited Syria and urged Bashar al-Assad to rupture relations with Russia and Iran. But President Assad did not yield to their demands. For this reason, they started planning an attack against Syria 10 years ago. Now, they have taken advantage of the so-called Arab Spring, which has ignited across Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, and I don't even know who will be next. Probably, it will affect Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates next year, because we see something of a snowball effect here. But Syria is a special case, for it is the most diverse, multi-ethnic country, where Sunni, Shia, Alawi and Christians have lived side by side. The West took to playing this card, seeking to exploit the issue of ethnicity to destabilize Syria. Everybody knows what they did in Lebanon 20 or 30 years ago. They intended to split that country into small ethnic states. But Syria intervened and sent its forces into Lebanon and prevented this from happening. So now they're trying to get their revenge on Syria for a number of reasons. For preventing the division of Lebanon and for denying them cooperation over Iraq. They are trying to turn Syria into a lesson for other Arab nations, showing them that anyone who dares oppose the West shall be destroyed by all means. When I hear American comments and then so some kind of uh, by some Western radio station, television companies, I see that people in the West are amazed by what's going on in the Middle East today because when the Arab Spring started and when the West and the United States trying to help promote democracy, their style of democracy in the Middle East, they thought that the Arabs must be thankful to Washington for what they did for them. And now they see that they made a mistake. Instead of thank you, people are burning American diplomatic cars. So, so, are Arabs such an unthankful people or what? Or have the Americans made a mistake? America 
America calls itself a democracy. But I was invited to visit America a month ago for a meeting with a few opposition members and with some members of the U.S. Congress. But I was eventually denied entry in the United States. Why would a democratic country deny entry to a single person who intends to meet with Syrians, including both opposition activists and government supporters? Why did they prevent me from meeting with Americans so that I could ask them what exactly they want from Syria? What kind of democracy is it if they ban me from visiting America to express myself? They have denied me freedom of speech, but at the same time they see themselves entitled to intervene in the affairs of other nations. They've assigned themselves the right to meddle in our domestic politics and depose our leaders. Every time Barack Obama delivers a speech, he says, it's time for al-Assad to resign. But let me ask you, who was it that elected Bashar al-Assad as president? Was it Obama or the Syrian people? It was the people of Syria who elected Assad, and they are the only ones entitled to replace him. But the West is used to toppling foreign leaders. Let's remember Noriega of Panama and how they deposed him by force. In Tunisia, they toppled Bin Ali. In Libya, they had Gaddafi killed and brought his murderers into power. In Egypt, they did the same with Mubarak. All these leaders were once allies of the United States, while Bashar al-Assad has never even been their ally. That's why he's been able to resist their attempts at overthrowing him for 16 months. More than a hundred nations are waging war against Syria at the moment, and Syria is standing its ground against them. Only a few countries have stood behind Syria, Russia and other BRICS states. These nations have told the West that they are with Syria, and they've forced the West to reconsider their plans against our country. They've told the West that only the Syrian people have the right to replace their leaders. A change may not be imposed from abroad. Says Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun, the Grand Mufti of Syria. Spotlight will be back shortly and we'll continue this interview in less than a minute. They will. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm Al Grunov, and just a reminder that my guest today on the show is Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun. He is the Grand Mufti of Syria. Uh, we understand that uh, the uh, most pronounced word today in Syria is enemy. Everybody knows, every kid with a gun knows who, who is his enemy. But what about friends? Do people in Syria consider having any friends, I mean, within the country, outside the country? Are there friends? People need friends. They can't live without support, can't they? All Arab people support us. If you go to Tunisia now, there are many parties in the ruling coalition that support Syria. Many parties in Egypt support Syria. The same thing is true of Sudan, Kuwait and many other Arab countries. In the Islamic world, we have many supporters in India, Malaysia, Indonesia and many other countries. All of them believe that change should come from within Syria, not from the outside. The actual problem is mass media, who is controlled by governments, not by the people. Before I came here to Moscow, I was in Damascus a week ago, and all state-controlled broadcasters like Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, CNN and France 24 reported that Assad's air forces were bombing Damascus. I looked around, searching for these Assad's jets, but saw nothing at all. They said the same about Aleppo. So I picked up my phone, called my family, and also nothing at all. They keep repeating the news over and over, and then they bring some footage of pictures from Afghanistan or Iraq and edit them to look like Syrian news. But people no longer believe these reports. For this reason, we have many people with us, and it's quite enough for us to have God with us, because we are true and we are right.
Listen to the news about Aleppo. They picture Aleppo as a completely destroyed city with tens of thousands killed. More than five million live in the city. I assure you that since the beginning of the Battle of Aleppo, one or two thousand have been killed from all parties, including the opposition, the army, security and civilians. Only one district witnessed fighting which is now over. Aleppo is not a destroyed city, not at all. That's why I repeat once again that the media is exaggerating in trying to present a distorted image of Syria. For this reason, from this TV show, I would like to ask both the opposition and supporters to work to protect their country and their people. Come to dialogue. Sit around the table and end your differences because the world is watching and the enemies are laughing while our friends are feeling the pain. The Russian friends that I've met here from all political levels sincerely hope that things would end up soon in favor of the Syrian people by reconciliation. It's my pleasure and my honor to send my greetings from here to President Putin and to Minister Lavrov and to all friends who were not deceived by the fake news presented by mainstream Western media and Arab mass media. In reality, our Russian friends have told me things about Syria that I was unaware of myself. They monitor the situation very closely and they know what is going on and what will happen there a week later. This is why I am confident that we still have many friends. You are a religious leader of Syria, but when you're abroad, when you're in Russia, you here as a politician, of course, not another as a religious leader. So I would like to ask you, how do you consider Russia? What's Russia's place in the Syrian chart of friends and foes? I mean, friends and enemies, yes? Because Russia, Moscow, doesn't offer you unconditional support, does it? Firstly, Russia in its current position is not supporting the Syrian government. Rather, it is supporting Syria as a state and the Syrian people. The Russian support, in fact, means that Russia is supporting itself, because Syria is the last gate through which, if conquered, extremism and terror would move on into Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan and other countries. Let's remember the attempted assassination of the Tatar Mufti a month ago. If Western-backed extremists score a triumph in Syria, they would move on to the independent states located around Russia. For this reason, Russia not only stands by Syria, it also stands for itself. It is, in fact, defending itself against extremism. In its present position, Russia is defending Islam and Christianity alike. Russia is standing by justice against the monster America who wants to devour the whole world. America wants to conquer the Mediterranean and make it a private lake. They have demanded us not to allow Russian vessels sail in our waters, but we have strongly rejected their demands. We told them that we don't accept conditions from abroad. We are free in our choice. Therefore, Russia is not only showing itself as a friend to Syria and to the Syrian people, but it shows itself as a leader in the area of justice a leader in the United Nations and its Security Council and a supporter of weaker nations and weaker states. This is evident in Russia's stance on Iran's peaceful nuclear program. The West has been opposing this program, seeking to prevent it, while Russia insists that people have the right to own their peaceful nuclear programs. I want to quote you once again. You say Syria is the only country that has not kneeled down at the feet of the United States of America. Well, uh, but uh, what about Iran in the Middle East? I mean, there, there, there's a lot of countries, not only around the world, but in the Middle East, who are, who are fully independent, and they are independent from the United States. What makes you say so, that you're the only one? I believe that Syria and Iran are not the only nations that have not yielded to American pressure. Sure, there are other countries, such as North Korea, Cuba, and many other nations who have refused to kneel to the United States. For us, when we say that we will not kneel to America, this doesn't mean that we are hostile to the American people. We are against the American policy, which wants to control the whole world. Likewise, we 
have no problem with Jews as such, except for those who have occupied our territories. Our problems are therefore with American policies. We have a problem with America when it goes to Afghanistan and bombs it, or when it goes to Iraq and does the same, while providing Israel with 100 aircraft once every three years. Then they deny Russia the right to provide us with medical equipment, for instance. Why do they have the right to do things that they ban others from? America is the world's largest arms manufacturer and exporter, and no one can object to that. Last year, they sold $35 billion worth of weapons to Israel. Who has objected? Listen to them when they officially declare that Russia has violated the international law by selling two helicopters to Syria. Hence, Syria will not yield to their will, and Russia would not stand still, and Iran will continue to develop its technology. If they impose economic sanctions against us, we will still have the support of our friends. For this reason, the Russian foreign minister has stated that economic sanctions against Syria would not work. I say that sanctions will only make us stronger. We will not kneel. The United States is so deeply involved these days, both politically and militarily, in, in, in the conflicts in your region, that many people say that another military intervention, a military intervention in Syria, is only a matter of, 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 of time, that it will happen sooner or later. So, do you think that an intervention is really possible? And if it is possible, do you think Syria may avoid uh, the Libyan scenario? First, Syria is not Libya, because we don't have the petrol to pay off the West, nor are we Iraq. They have controlled the oil fields in Iraq and Libya for 25 years now. Meanwhile, Syria has managed to stand against their aggression for over 17 months, and it will continue to do so until we succeed in securing a better future for our people. The opposition in Syria should wake up and realize that they are not serving the interests of Syria and the Syrian people. Instead, they are working for the West. That's why we are calling upon them to come to dialogue and try to solve our problems ourselves. I do not believe that a military intervention against Syria is all but impossible. But I am sure that with the first missile impacting in Syria, the whole Arab world and all Islamic countries will rise and ask the West why they are doing this to Syria. You've done this in Libya for its oil, and in Tunisia you've pretended it's for democracy, while bringing extremists to power, and now you shall taste the bitterness of their deeds. In Egypt the same is true, although we don't oppose the will of the Egyptian people or the people of Tunisia. We stand strongly against the parties that rule in the name of religion. This is very dangerous. I don't support the Democratic Christian Party in Europe, nor do I support the parties that rule in the name of religion. I'm calling upon the Islamic parties that are now in power in the Arab world to reform themselves into secular political parties and keep religion separated from politics. Thank you very much, Shukran. And just a reminder that my guest today was Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun, Grand Mufti of Syria. And that's it for now from all of us here. If you want to have your sales spotlight, you can always drop me a line my email. Spotlight will be back with more first and comments on what's going on in and outside Russia. Until then, stay on RT and take care of it.